2.1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. To preach about his grace, his grace is actually unspeakable. For me to speak on it, it is quite unspeakable. There is a song that goes, there is no other word but grace, but amazing. Because when you talk about his grace, oh, the depth of its riches, how deep his grace is, if we would only understand. We Christians know about salvation by grace. We preach about it to others, but I believe that we ourselves need to be preached about this salvation by grace as well. You might ask, why do we need to know about the preaching of salvation by grace? I already know about it, Pastor. I know how grace is such a wonderful thing, that our works are not required, and it is only by the grace of Jesus Christ that we are saved and we can go to heaven. I am familiar with that, Pastor. Why would you have to preach about that? Because Paul also mentions at verse 11, wherefore, remember. Why would Paul preach about us being lost in our sins? Why would Paul preach about our salvation by grace if we were already saved by grace, not by works? Why would Paul remind us, tell us to remember how rich this grace is? As a matter of fact, Paul did not have to explain about grace in Ephesians chapter 2 because Ephesians chapter 1, he already described to you, he already preached to you how rich God's grace is. If you look at chapter 1 and verse 2, grace be to you. Verse 3, blessed be God who blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Verse 4, God elected you when you became in him. Verse 5, he predestinated you for heaven. Verse 6, you are going to be raptured up to glory with him. Verse 7, you are redeemed by his blood because that's how rich his grace is. <laughs> Verse 8, he abounded such grace toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Verse 9, God revealed his will to you. Verse 10, his plan is perfect for you. Verse 11, you obtain an inheritance. Verse 12, all it took was trusting in Jesus Christ to receive his grace. Verse 13, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit because of his grace. Verse 14, you are sealed to the rapture because of his grace. He described the riches of his grace in Ephesians chapter 1. Why would he have to repeat it again at Ephesians chapter 2? Unless he says, we need to remember. In other words, we don't really understand his grace. Which is why he would preach to saved Ephesians again. About, remember about your lost condition and how you got saved by grace. He's telling them that again. This should be preached to lost people, not to saved Christians. But Paul the Apostle believed it was important to preach this salvation by grace, the riches of his grace, to saved Christians because they had a memory problem, because they 
don't really understand how deep this grace is. If that's what Paul thought when he wrote to the Ephesians, what about us? I wonder how much do we truly understand this salvation by grace, the riches of his grace. You and I might say we already know about it. I got already saved by grace. You don't need to preach about it, Pastor. I know how great his grace is, but I really wonder if we really know how great his grace is. I strongly believe we don't, otherwise Paul wouldn't need to remind us. So this preaching, you might think, is something that you already know about grace, but let me remind you. Let today just be a reminder. If this is something you already know, if this is something that you already applied in your heart, let me remind you again. Because Paul thought it was important to remind you. Perhaps there were some things about God's grace that you missed out on that you need to be reminded. Perhaps there were some things about God's grace that you've forgotten, and that's the reason why you need to be reminded. Whatever the case is, Paul thought that it was important to remind the Ephesians, I think that it would be important for me to remind you saved Christians as well. So let me remind you about God's grace I would like to speak about the unspeakable grace. Will you pray with me? Now, Father, fill within me <coughs> the power of your Holy Spirit and wisdom from on high. Lord, how, how much have I forgotten about your grace? How much have you shown me how rich your grace is? <coughs> how much have you encouraged me about your grace? Will you do so with these people? Lord, as human flesh, we tend to forget. Remind us once more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My first point is to remember your prior state. Remember your prior state of grace. Prior to your state of grace, what were we at verse 1? And you hath thee quickened who were dead... <clears throat> in trespasses and sins. In other words, you were dead because of your sins. So God had to make you alive. Verse 2, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In other words, you were controlled, you were possessed, by Satan himself, you followed whatever spirit the world took its course and you were enslaved by it, you were not free. That was prior to your state of grace. I also see at verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation <clears throat> in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Prior to your state of grace, all you focused on was fulfilling the very desires of your flesh. Now think about that. That is prior to your state of grace. Prior to your state of grace. Prior to your state of grace, what you were was enslaved by sin. You could not be free. Prior to your state of grace, you were a walking dead man. Prior to your state of grace, all you cared about, listen, was doing what you wanted. Now you might say, Pastor, I'm already a saved by grace Christian. Why do you have to tell me that? Because you need to be reminded, for even though God saved you from all that, and you're a saved by grace Christian, even though you're not a child of wrath anymore, the problem is, is that even though you're not a part of that, you are walking in it. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin 
live any longer therein. In other words, even though you're a saved by grace Christian, you're not a part of that sinful state anymore, you still are capable of walking in it. Some of you walk in it. Some of you, listen, want to walk in it. Some of you don't appreciate that you are saved by grace. Some of you think of it as a chore, as a hardship, that God has saved you by His grace and that you think that it's unfair to be a Christian and woe is you because you're trying to live righteously for Jesus Christ. After all, He bought you by His grace. So you're supposed to work for Him and you're supposed to live for Him and you go, woe is me, woe is me. Because you want to fulfill the desire of your flesh. You want to live for yourself. Back when you were lost, back when you were not a safe Christian, you did whatever you wanted. Why can't I live that way? When you live in the desire of your flesh, you know what that verse says? That verse says you are by nature the children of wrath. Even though you're not a child of wrath, you can walk in the lust of the flesh and still grieve the Lord, get him a little upset. You can still be capable of being controlled by that spirit enslaved. Even though you're no longer a part of it, you walk in it. You're no longer a walking dead man, but you walk as if you're a dead man. You know, when I see these poor people, and let me demonstrate two sad examples to you, two examples to you, to illustrate about this tragic state of a walking dead man who's possessed by sin. When I see these poor people out there, you've heard the thing, what they call the zombie drug. For some of you who don't know what the zombie drug is, this is something more dangerous than heroin itself. This drug is so dangerous that a person, if he were to take that drug, I mean, it is combined with the, with the strongest potency and addiction that the person is high on the drug. And then what it does is that his skin is tearing apart. And then his body is melting because the drug has such serious side effect that it tears him, that it tears his body apart. But because that poor man, all he could do is just feel high on that drug. It was higher than heroin. And he is delighting in the loss of his flesh. And because his flesh is feeling so good, he could care less that his body is tearing apart. That drug has a hold of him. It's gotten a control of him. And you can just <laughs> clap your hands in front of that poor man's face and say, hey, wake up. Can't you see what this drug is doing to you? But that man, he cannot see or hear the clap of your hands, but is just lost in his drug because that zombie drug has gotten a hold of him. Oh, he's a zombie. He's a walking dead man because that drug has gotten a hold of him. And he can't wake up out of it. It's as if he's being controlled. That drug has controlled his mind, has controlled his feelings. And he could care less that he's not wearing his shoes outside in the bitter cold and his feet are freezing to death and he is stinking up to high heaven. His clothes are tattered. He doesn't have fresh clothes on his back. He hasn't showered and he smells and his skin is not just smelling rotten flesh. It is turning into rotten flesh itself and his eyes are sagging and he is bleeding himself and he is just killing himself and that drug is tearing him from the inside out and all he is is a walking dead man controlled why he wouldn't be controlled if he didn't desire to fulfill his loss 
he wouldn't be a dying man, dying in his condition, if he didn't desire to fulfill his loss. He wouldn't be rotten, stinking outside, in a poor, depraved condition without any help, starving without clothes. He wouldn't be that way if he didn't think about fulfilling the desire of his flesh. See, all that came because of one thing, desiring to fulfill the lust of my flesh. Let me give you a second sad illustration. Now, nobody likes mosquitoes. I hate mosquitoes. If you, if you see a, a hundred mosquitoes swarming around the room, you go insane. One mosquito is enough to to bother the fire out of you, especially if you're sleeping at night. Just one mosquito. You hear it like that. And it lands, and you don't know if it landed on your skin and you just slap yourself several times. And then you scratch yourself and you go, oh, it bit me. And you don't know if it bit you. And you want to kill that thing, but it is so annoying and it's so small and you can't find it. The worst part is it happens in the middle of the night. And you have to turn on all lights to find that one little mosquito and that drives you stinking mad. It makes you so upset. You want that mosquito gone, but it's in the room. You want it out. You want it out. No one is happy to have a mosquito in the room. Now, my friend, let me combine these two illustrations and tell you something about you and the Lord. Do you understand that sin is what controls you like that drug and is killing you from the inside out? And as you stink up to high heaven and that sin is tearing you from the inside out and you don't care about it, you don't even know about it because all you are is lost in the lust of your flesh and then here you are with the guilt of sin. Here you are, sin is making you reap what you sow. Here it is, sin is taking away your joy. And here it is, sin is making you miserable. And sin can only bring you death. And you're a walking dead man. But you could care less because you are lost in the desires. The desire of the lust of your flesh. And every time sin is tearing you apart... God is getting angrier and angrier with you because all he sees is a thousand mosquitoes that are swarming around within his abode where he lives for he inhabits all of creation. That is where he lives. And he, all he sees is a thousand swarming mosquitoes that makes him more angrier and angrier and angrier every day. And you could care less as you are lost in your sin. You're just like a stinking mosquito who doesn't give a lick who doesn't think about God, just minding its own business, living up in sin, and as you are killing yourself, you're making God more angry with you. And it's so only a matter of time, he just wants to wipe you out. But because God is infinite and God is eternal, when he kills you, friend, he doesn't just kill you like that. It costs eternity, eternity in hell. That's prior to your salvation by grace. Do you realize that you wanting to fulfill the desire of your flesh, how, ang how much more angry you're making God? And how much you're tearing yourself apart without you realizing it. You could care less because you're high on the lust of the flesh. And it's gotten control of you. You're enslaved to it. And you don't care about God's grace. You don't think about God's grace. You don't think about serving Jesus Christ. You don't think about staying away from sin. You don't think about serving the Lord. Because you're just lost in the your own fleshly desires 
You're a walking dead man. And not only that, how much more angry is God with you? Didn't the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed? Keep hearing the How much more can we take? Be sure your sin will find you out. Why? None of this would happen. None of this would happen if you didn't desire the lust of your flesh. See, all this happens from desiring the lust of your flesh. Some of you have dreams and what you want to do in the world and your life and your fleshly things and you have no idea how that zombie drug has enslaved you and blinded you and crippled you and tear you apart and you are right now being without clothes and starving to death, stinking up to high heaven, but you don't see anything of that because you're lost in my desires. And at the same time, God's patience is wearing thin and that mosquito is swarming louder and louder and it's annoying the fire out of him. And as a holy God, as a just God and as a God who promised you reap what you sow and be sure your sin will find you out. Pam, pam, pam. Do you realize that because we don't see God angry, we have no idea how much we've upset him. You're afraid of the judgment seat of Christ because you're afraid to see God's face? Might as well wake up, smell the coffee, and look at his face right now. We should not exist here. You think your Christian life is bad? You, you should be in a worse place. You have no idea. Well, what about those wicked people out there? How come they have it better than me and all that? You want to be them? You know how God's wrath is against them to the uttermost and what they will burn in hell for? And you have no idea what they're reaping and sowing right now. Yeah, the Christian life is hard, isn't it, huh? Yeah, you know, uh, the world has it better than me, huh? Yeah, maybe I should be a lukewarm Christian. Maybe I should be worldly-minded. Maybe I should play with sin a little bit. Oh, God will understand. Uh, let me take a break here and Preach. just fulfill the lust of my flesh. Preach. Take your chance, buddy. Preach. And you're just building up his patience, you little mosquito, you. Keep, swar keep swarming. Keep pretending that you're not going to get slapped. When God slaps you around, you know it's going to hurt. Verse 4. But God. Amen. But God. My second point, realize the providing state of grace. Amen. Realize the providing state of grace. Amen. But God, who is rich in mercy Amen. for his great love wherewith he loved us. Amen. Oh, thank God for verse 4. Amen. You and I should have been shot, should have been slapped a long time ago. You and I should have remained high on that zombie drug of sin, fulfilling our desires, doing whatever we want. But God came in. Amen. 
But God came in. Thank God for God. Thank God he ruined your desires. Thank God he stopped you from fulfilling the lust of your flesh. Thank God that he stepped up and showed you a way. But God. Do you know who God is? That verse says he's rich in mercy. Where is this great love he loved us? There are theologians that look at this aspect, this attribute of God, and consider it the benevolence of God. Oh, we don't understand. We do not understand our God. Do you understand what benevolence is? Basically, God is looking after our welfare, not for his. That's his attribute. But God, see right here, he wasn't looking after his welfare. He looked after our welfare. He saw us lost and enslaved in sin, fulfilling our own desire. And out of great benevolence, he stepped in and he said, I'm going to put a stop to that. I'm going to give you a way out. When he looks after your welfare, he's not thinking about his, but your welfare. You know, I, what's the most important to God is his glory. Amen. You and I are created for his glory. So then, how is it that he cares about our welfare rather than his if his glory must be prioritized? Because the Bible says, when we got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, we were created in his image. So, you know what you and I have? We have the image of God in us. You know what God sees? He sees a part of himself in us. So it's his job to care for that, prioritize that, because that's his image and glory. <laughs> so do you understand that when bad things happen in your life, that the most important person right now is you, that God cares about you? Why? Because you're a part of him. You're a part of the body of Christ. And when you feel like that God is letting you down and God doesn't care about you, then you know what you are saying? You're saying that God does not care about his glory. But because his glory is at stake, he must take care of you. He must look after you. He must give you the best in life. So when he says all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, he means every word of that. He will give you the best, the best, the best that he himself would want for himself. Because his glory is at stake. And if you're going through something unfair, something bad, and you think that life is not good to you, then God has disgraced his glory. Unless, unless God says, no, I have a better plan for this. I really care for that person. I want to give that person the best. But you see, we, but God, oh, but God, who is rich in mercy, that, that gives another attribute of his, his faithfulness, his faithfulness. In other words, God is eternal, and when he gives his word, he has to keep his word. Why? Because God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not spoken it? Shall he not make it good? Shall he not make it good? If he mistreats you, then God's the biggest liar in history, and God cannot be God. But how can God go back against his word? God has to hold true to his word. If you believe every word is preserved in that King James Bible, don't think that he can't preserve his word with you. And when he promised you all things work together for good, when he promised you his grace is sufficient, and when he promised you that he will give you the best in life, he will be true to his word because our God is faithful. Amen. What's at stake here is if he doesn't keep his word to you, if he won't give you his grace and treat you well, 
then you know what is at stake here? He's the biggest sinner of all time. He sinned because he lied. My God ain't a sinner. My God is true and faithful. He kept his word for the past 6,000 years of mankind. He will do it again. Did he not tell Abraham he would make him a great nation? Kept his word. Didn't have a child for years. Didn't have a child for years. So Abraham thought, like many of us would think, well, I'll help God out. Because I don't know if God will really take care of me here unless I do this part right here. So let me get Hagar involved right here. Got himself in a flat-footed mess, like some of you. Like some of you trying to work out your own things and then... Helping out God, what a fine thing it helped you with now, right? It put you in a bigger mess. All you had to do, Abraham, was just let it go and let God do his work. And when God does his work, it can go 100 years long, Abraham. It can go 100, you can be 100 years old, but guess what? God will keep his word. And you got a son, Abraham. You got a miraculous birth because we serve a God of miracles. That's God's job. Is in impossible scenarios, he will keep his word for you. Oh, but God kept his word to Abraham, didn't he? Because even after Isaac, the Jews forsaken God. They sinned against him. And God had to cast Israel aside and they lost their nation for more than a thousand years. But God kept his word. Abraham, your seed will continue. I don't care if you think God broke his promise when there was a holocaust of millions of Jews who died out. Jews who wandered and had no home for over a millennium. The Catholic Church, the Roman institution, kept pushing them around. The Russian programs pushed them around. Jews had no home. They were outnumbered. They could have been wiped out a billion times. But God is faithful to his word and kept them alive. Gave them their nation. And he's not done with them yet. And God will faithfully keep his word at the millennium when he comes down and those Jews who've been praying, who've been waiting for their Messiah for thousands and thousands of years, God said, I never forgot my word to you. I don't care if you feel like God cast you aside. And it goes a thousand years long. God will keep his word. Amen. That's my God. Do we understand our God? He's infinite. He cannot compromise. He cannot go against his word. Do we understand the nature of our God? The attribute of our God? I don't care how hopeless your life is. I don't care if you feel like that you're about to die. I don't care if it goes a thousand years long or if God cast you aside. He kept his word to you and he will fulfill it. Isn't Israel the greatest proof? In spite of what Hitler did to them, in spite of the hell they went through, look at Israel, look at Israel. And God can't take care of you. Changes everything. You were a walking dead person. Building up God's wrath. Enslaved by the chains of darkness. One thing changed it. God. God. Because that's who he is. He is faithfulness. That's who God is. He is benevolence. That's who God is. But that's not enough. That's not enough. For we have not talked about his grace yet. <laughs> Woo! But God, who is 
benevolent and will always look after our welfare. The God who is faithful and will stay true to his word and keep his promise to you. The God who is also grace. You know, benevolence is where God looks after your welfare, but he can expect something in return. He can expect some favor in return. But grace is where God gives it to you without any favor. Do you understand? Do you understand that God gives you not just benevolence, but grace where he doesn't expect any favors. He gives you his grace. Oh, what wonderful grace the Bible says right here in verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins. Hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. You know what grace did? It saved you from that zombie drug. That life out in the streets. Out in the corner. High on me, me, me. My ways. What I want. My desire. That's what grace did. It saved you from your greatest enemy, yourself. Your desires that you're enslaved to, that was killing you, that tore your body in half, that couldn't care less if you were rotting like rotten eggs and smelling up to high heaven, being the annoying mosquito buzzing around, expecting any moment the wrath of God. And grace is what saved you all of that. You know why you're still breathing? Grace. You know why you're able to come to church today? Grace. You know why you're able to accomplish certain things for the Lord so far? Grace. Why? It saved you from yourself. Oh, I... Why won't the Lord uh, make my life better like the worldly people and just let me follow a little bit of my desire? Can't God compromise right here? Oh, uh, why, why, Lord, won't you answer my prayer on my desire? Can't you give me a little break right here? You know what God's grace says? No. Why? Because I'm so good to you, I'm going to say no. Because I love you more than you can love yourself. I'm going to tell you, get away from that. You know what God's grace is? That you don't have those things of the world. You know what God's grace is? That you don't have those sins that you can play around with anymore. You know what God's grace is? That your dreams are and aspirations... From your desires are crushed. You know what God's grace is? Saving you from yourself. That's God's grace. And if you don't want God's grace, then have at it. Go to your desire. All it takes is following your desire. And you are back to where you're from. Rotting on the ground, smelling like rotten fish and eggs, high on the drug, the zombie drug of desire and flesh, having no care of what the Lord and others view you as, and lost in flesh and flesh, controlled and enslaved and bound and imprisoned by flesh. Have at it if you don't want God's grace. Have at it if you don't want God's grace. How many of you don't want God's grace today and go back to the world? Or... Are you grateful that his grace kept you from that horrible zombie drug called you? It's his grace. 
if you think that you're going through a hard time, if you think that you're sacrificing so much for Jesus, if you feel like that life is unfair and then uh, through your saved Christian salvation by grace Christian walk and that God hasn't been good to you and that everything is tumbling against you and then you're getting stressed out and then the storms of life are crashing over your head and that nothing's going right for you, nothing is going right accordingly to your desires. Remember, that's all God's grace. And you don't have to have it. You don't have to. You don't have to. All it takes is follow your desire. That's all it takes to get back to the zombie drug. That's all it takes. Go for it. Go for it. Today's preaching, what you can learn today is follow your desire. Thank God for his grace. If I were to think about 10 years ago, 10 years ago, if I followed my desires, what would I be doing now? Ask yourself, if you were to follow your desires three years ago, what would you be doing now? You know what you're looking at right now? Yeah. Trophies of his grace. <laughs> when you're hearing the hymn singing, you know what you're hearing? A tune of his grace. When you're fellowshipping with each other, you know what you're witnessing? You know what you're looking at? God's grace. You know what you're hearing right now? Grace. Everything in this room, everything that you see, everything you hear, everything you feel in your heart, this is grace. This building is his grace. The presence of everyone here is his grace. You knowing somebody here is his grace. Verse 6, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you know what his grace did? His grace gave us a reservation in heaven. Do you understand that God, he saved you from the mess that you're in? And then on top of that, knowing that you would want to go back to the zombie drug here and there. Knowing that uh, you're going to upset him here and there and grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Even though he cleaned you up, he got you out. He washed away all the sins with his precious blood. He got that zombie effect out of your life. No, after doing all that, he knew that you would go back here and there and yet said, I reserved you a clean place to live with me. Wow. Yeah, I know you'll be that annoying mosquito again, but I still have a room for you to stay with me. That's his grace. Oh, his grace is wonderful grace. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Do you understand that his grace is not even revealed yet? His full grace has not been revealed yet? Brother and sister in Christ, you have no idea that God is infinite in his grace. That means his grace, as the Bible says, oh, the depth of his riches, they are unsearchable. Brother and sister in Christ, when you, in the ages to come, you know what that means? That means in the next years of your life and throughout once you hit heaven and through the ages after that and the ages after that and the ages and down through the ages after that, you have yet to experience the very tip of his grace. For his grace is infinite and it is so deep that after a thousand years in the millennium, you've barely scratched the surface of his grace. 
We don't know what it all entails. You heard it all. Rulership over kingdoms. An inheritance of all things. The universe will be ruled and traveled upon. The tree of life, the water of life. No pain, no sickness, no sorrow. Brother and sister in Christ, that is only the part, that is only a part of his grace. In the ages to come, you have no idea what else is out there as you got saved by grace and you enter the realm of eternity in the ages to come. God still has plenty to offer you. Wow. You think you know what grace is? Everything you heard in the Bible is not even the part of it. Because God's infinite, so his grace will be infinite. Oh, he can go on infinitely, infinitely, infinitely. And his grace will just feed upon everything that you can feast upon. And you will be so stuffed that you will be content with what you got on his grace. And his grace is still abundant in supply. And the half has not yet been told. Do you realize that what you're experiencing so far in his grace is just a little bit? This is not everything to his grace. Do you understand that? What you and I are experiencing is not even all of his grace. But everything in the world, everything of the desires of your flesh, you hit a limit. You hit a limit. And when you hit the limit, you try to f find it again, that feeling, that desire... And you'll never get it. But grace has no limit. But I like what that verse says. And the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. <laughs> so, in other words, it's not just the ages to come. Even right now, he gives you the abundant riches of his grace. Oh, praise the Lord Jesus Christ for what his grace has promised to you. He promised you that all things would work together for good to them that love God. He promised you that he would supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He promised you that I will never leave you nor forsake you. He promised you my joy I leave with you. He promised you, ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. He promised you that he will give you better than what you can ask or receive, even with the prayer answer, no. He promised you 200 promises of God. What more can he offer to you as I'm feasting on the riches of his grace? All I am was Mephibosheth, a crippled, a sinner, made to be destroyed, made to be wrath, born to be doomed to hell for all eternity. All I was was a dead dog, Mephibosheth. But as I am sitting on his table... I am feasting on the riches of his grace. And then I see Amnon right there. And Amnon, he's not thankful for the riches that he's feasting upon. Oh no, he's lusting after somebody. All he's thinking about is the lust of his flesh. And he can't think about the feast of the riches of his grace. Oh, you go to Absalom. And Absalom, he, all he could think about was bitterness. That he couldn't think about the feast of the riches of King David, David's table of grace. He couldn't think about that because all he thought about was bitterness and hurt and pain. And that he wants to get even. Oh, and then there goes Adonijah. Adonijah on the other side of the table. And all he wants was, I want something better than this. I could get something better than this. Oh, Mephibosheth, I can't imagine, would care less what Absalom, Adonijah, and Amnon wanted. All he could say was, if you're not going to feast on the riches of his grace, I'll eat your food. I'll feast on your riches of his grace. Give it to me. I'm thankful. I was crippled. I was a dead dog. You can think about bitterness. You can think about the lust. And you can think about something better. But let me just get lost feasting on the riches of his grace. Amen. Amen. 
Amnon, you still lusting? You got a desire of the flesh you want to fulfill? That's all you can think about? Rather than the feasting on the riches of his grace? How much time have you wasted? How many foods have you left over that is just waiting for you to be eaten? Absalom, all you can feel is pain and hurt and get bitter? That's all you can feel? My goodness, no wonder you're starving to death. Starving to death from tasting at least one of his grace. Adonijah, you think there's something better out there, huh? And that's why the feasting of the riches have meant nothing to you. How much time have you wasted? How much food have you wasted? I don't know about you. But I think it's better to be Mephibosheth. And just spend every time that you got left in your life feasting on the riches of his grace. The Bible says at verse 8 and 9, the last thing I want to point out. So I've talked about the third point. The present state of grace, which was verses 5 through 7. Now I would like to talk about verses 8 through 9. Verses 8 through 9. The Bible says, for by grace... Are you saved through faith? And then of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can I tell you something that's better than the ages to come of the unlimited riches of his grace? Can I tell you something better than the 200 promises of God that he promised you where you're feasting on his riches of his grace. Can I tell you something better than the grace where he delivered you from yourself, from that zombie drug? The greatest gift of grace he ever gave to you was that you don't have to work a thing Amen. to be saved from hell. That you didn't have to die for your sins, but he died for you. And he gave you eternity in heaven with him. That alone is greater than all his graces combined. For if I had 200 promises of God, what good would they be if I died and burned in hell for all eternity? What good was it that God delivered me from the zombie drug because of his grace... And then I go back and I'm doomed to hellfire. What good is it if I had unlimited riches of his grace for ages to come if I lose it all and end up in hell for a longer period of time? See, his salvation by grace is the greatest thing that you and I can ever receive. If you don't think salvation by grace is that much worth it. Then don't, then don't have Jesus die for it. And let's see you try to earn salvation by grace. Let's see you pay for that. If you don't think salvation by grace is to you, you know how you're going to earn it? You know how you're going to pay for it? You can work all you want in your righteousness, but you'll never be as righteous as Jesus Christ for 33 and a half years without sin. Oh, your works of righteousness will never amount to everything. You think being righteous as a Christian, working as a righteous Christian is hard now? You do a hundred times more hard than that to earn your salvation to get saved out of hell. You know how you're going to earn your salvation by grace? Step up right here. And don't put the money in the offering plate. You can give me a billion dollars, a trillion dollars, all the money in the world, all the riches that you can give will never pay salvation by grace. You can own all the world and give up all the world, but that will never pay off salvation by grace. You want to pay off salvation by grace? Never sin. Endure everything that Jesus went through as a human being. 
through all the sorrows and troubles of life without sinning and then step up right here and give up your hands and let's nail that to the cross. And you hang on there and don't give up and you just hang on the cross, feel the pain, can't breathe, suffocate yourself and you bleed yourself out until God says it is finished. Then you can earn salvation. Step on up. Put this over your head. Then you can earn salvation by grace. That's how much it's going to cost. Not your life, not torture, your very own righteous being to the end of your last breath. That's what it's going to cost. Step on up. God, Jesus stepped on my plate. And I didn't have to pay one dime. Not even an Abraham's Lincoln penny for it. Oh, thank you, Lord. How can Christians not appreciate his grace? How can people want to live prior to the state of grace and be back on the zombie drug? How can anyone want to please desires? What I want, what I want. How can anyone think that the Christian life, living the Christian life, salvation by grace is, oh, an unfair and a difficult, hard life? How can anyone think like that? It's amazing. What are you going to do after this preaching now? What do you think God would want from you after that? After hearing his preaching of grace, what do you think God will want from you after that? You might say, I'm going to go on the altar, Pastor, and thank him for real this time, for the grace that he's given to me. That's good, brother, but actually that's not what God would want from you. You might say, well, Pastor, I've gotten under conviction. And this time I'm going to remind myself how real his grace is and take it with more gratitude this time. You know, that's good, brother and sister, but that's not what God would want from you today. You might say, well, because I received such an amazing offer of grace, I'm going to work it out the best that I can and pay him back. That's wonderful, brother. But believe it or not, that's not what God will want from you today. You know how you're going to thank him for real and work really hard for him for real and uh, remind yourself with appreciation how great his grace is? You know how you're going to do all that? Just one thing. And this is all God ever wanted. But you've forgotten the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Why? It is the gift of God. You know what God expects from you after paying that much grace for you, giving you that grace? It's called a gift. All he wants you to do is receive it. It's all he ever wants from you is to just take it. Because if you took it, you would thank him for real. If you took it, you wouldn't reject it like it before and say, I don't want this. I want the desires of the world. See, by whining and complaining and taking his grace for granted, you dismissed his gift. You didn't wholeheartedly receive it. See, if you received his grace, it's going to mean so much for you that, wow, I'm going to work as hard as I can. Give it everything that I got. Because this grace is too wonderful. 
But see, there were so many wasted years, wasted days, that you've put off his grace, put off his grace, put off his grace, put off his grace, to shoot yourself with a drug called desire and laying down in the gutter when God offered his grace to you all that time and says, all you got to do is receive it. If you received it, you're going to thank him for it. If you received it, you're going to live with much appreciation and remind yourself about it. If you received it, you're going to work as hard as you can with every ounce of your being to pay him back. Now the question is, just like before you got saved, do you remember the gift called grace? God would like to ask you one more time, will you receive it or reject it again? Every head bow and every eye shut.